He's a Bible teacher, an evangelist from Arkansas, and um, we had him. They had the privilege of having him at our Midwest conference about four years ago, and our hearts were thrilled uh, that he was able to come back and share with us again. Now, he's gonna he's gonna make you think that he's just an old country preacher from Arkansas. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with being that. Um, But I am um, in awe of his ability to to explain and to apply a text of Scripture with clarity and accuracy. And um, we praise God for our brother David Miller. And so, Brother David, if you would be so kind to come and to open God's Word for us tonight and preach the Word. I am preaching tonight from the Old Testament book of Malachi, chapter 3 and verse 6. I want to talk to you about the immutability of God or the wonder of an unchanging Lord. The text says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you that I only have two points in my sermon. It just doesn't hardly seem right to preach a two-point sermon. The student asked the professor one day in class, how many points should a good sermon have? And the professor said, at least one. I have probably been guilty on occasions of preaching some sermons that didn't even have one good point. But tonight I have two excellent points in my sermon. Point number one is the profound affirmation of the text. I am the Lord. I change not. Isn't that a profound affirmation? And secondly, I want you to see the practical application of the text. Since God is unchanging in his love for Jacob, therefore the sons of Jacob have not been consumed. Let us be reminded that good, sound theology will always have a warm and wonderful application in our Christian pilgrimage. Now, under this first heading, the profound affirmation of the text, I want to do two things, maybe more. But first, I want to give a definition for immutability. Immutability in God refers to the absolute unchangeableness of his nature. Whatever our God was in essence, in eternity past, he remains the same 
today, and he shall continue the same throughout all of eternity future. God can never be any more or less than he has always been. He can never be any bigger or smaller than he's always been. He can't be any better and he can't be any worse. God does not change. We can use the similitude of a wheel in our thinking about the essence of God, the immutability of God being the hub and all of the other attributes, the spokes of that wheel. Was God ever sovereign upon the throne? Then he is immutably so. Now, you can go off to school and earn a PhD and write you a book as Norman Geisler did and give it this title, Chosen But Free. But we would do well to remember tonight that God has not abdicated the throne. And one could run the risk of going to the judgment only to discover that he was neither chosen nor free. You can write a book as Frank Tupper did and give it this title, A Scandalous Providence, only to discover in your own personal experience as you live life that you are not in control, but rather the government of God extends to every aspect of your being. Was God holy in the beginning? He remains holy. God has not changed. The God of the Bible has never known any addition, aberration, or alteration. He has not changed. The God of the historic Christian religion has never experienced any emergency, exigency, or evolution. He has not changed. The God of the Bible has known no infirmity, improvement, or enlargement. He remains the same. The God in whom we believe, the God whom we confess, has never known any vacillation or vicissitude or variation. What he was, he is and ever shall be. God has not changed. And so I confess freely and gladly that I grew up out in the country, cut my teeth on the old heavenly highway hymn book. I'm unashamed. And I learned how to sing that old song. Time is filled with swift transition. Naught of earth unmoved can stand. 
Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God unchanging hand. Now, is there anyone here but us? Can we talk? I need to tell you further that immutability in God is an in communicable and non-transferable attribute. I mean, no one else has immutability. Not even Benny Hinn. <laughs> Not even Kenneth Copeland. Not even Rod Parsley. And a hundred more in that genre. I learned something about transferring. My son Josh went off to college. And I discovered that with the best financial planning known unto mortal man, you could never plan for all of the contingencies and eventualities that would come to bear upon his college career. And so the call would come. And he'd say, Mom, I love you. Can I talk to Dad? And he'd commence the story about how this situation had arisen and how he must take advantage of the opportunity and could you please transfer a hundred dollars into my checking account? And so I would call Marcia at the Cleburne County Bank and say, Marcia, this is David Miller, and I need you to transfer one hundred dollars from my account and place it into Josh's checking account. I learned that if you have a little money in your account, you can transfer it into someone else's account. But I am telling you tonight, beloved, that immutability in God can never be transferred to another. It is incommunicable. Now, have you heard what Kenneth says, Kenneth says that God's ambition from day one has been to reproduce himself on earth. And then he says, I am a little God. And Benny argued with Kenneth in the early days, but at last acquiesced and declared himself to be a little God. And Paul and Jan had them on the show. And they discussed it at great length until finally Paul slapped his knee and pointed his finger into the camera and said, that settles it. We are little gods. I don't want to hear any more arguing about it. Well, I've got some news for you. You're not even little gods. Itsy bitsy, teeny weeny gods. You are not gods, period. And furthermore, you're never going to be made God either. Now the God of the Bible is omnipresent and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. 
How can you be a little bit omnipresent? The God of the Bible is omniscient and the haughty and the high-minded cannot comprehend him. The God of the Bible is omnipotent and the host of hell cannot conquer him. But listen, what if Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn became omnipresent? omniscient and omnipotent. What if that happened? Well, beloved, I am here to tell you, even if that happened, they still would not be God. Because in order for them to be omnipresent, omniscient and omnipotent, they would have to undergo a change. a change in their very nature, in the wool and warp of their being. And having undergone a change in their essential nature, they would then be disqualified for being immutable. Go thou and think on that. God does not change. And that attribute can never be communicated or transferred to mortal men. Now that's my definition. I want you to see now a difficulty associated with this doctrine. There is in the Bible this class of scriptures like the one before us. I am the Lord, I change not. The strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. But you are aware that there is another class of scriptures which seem to teach that God does, in fact, repent. Have you read some of those texts? For example, in the book of Jonah, we have these words in chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Do you remember this story? But Jonah arose to go unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and found a ship going unto Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. It was a classic case of his theological deficiency being manifested. That he could go where the Lord was not. Doctrine matters. And the Lord hurled the great storm out across the Mediterranean and the soldiers threw him overboard and providence had a fish in the right place at the right time in the right frame of mind to swallow up a backslidden prophet (laughs) and three days and three nights he was in the belly of the fish and in chapter 3 verse 1 we have this statement And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. 
Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even unto the least of them. And verse 10 says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Now, how does this jive with the immutability of God? Well, I want to tell you, God often speaks anthropomorphically after the manner of a mortal man. God often accommodates himself in language to our limited ability to understand. God's nature was not changed in these circumstances. God was immutable in his determination that he would destroy Nineveh unless they repented. He was just as immutable in his determination to show mercy to them if they repented. And what we have here is God changing his outward conduct toward the Ninevites due to a, con a change in the Ninevites, a change that had been wrought by God himself. God's nature had not changed. No difficulty at all. But now I want you to put that aside. That's the first half of my sermon. Why don't you do like this and just go. I want to talk to you now about the practical application of this text. Therefore, on the basis of God's immutable love and commitment to Jacob, they have not been consumed. But I want to point out two things for you. One, Jacob had sinned, and yet he had not been consumed. In chapter 1, verse 6, we have this statement. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If I then be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest, that despise my name. You offer the lame and the sick and the blind on my table. You wouldn't even do that if you invited your favorite political candidate to your home for a meal. You want to know what the sons of Jacob did? they would not open the doors at God's house before they had inquired how much remuneration they would receive for their effort. They would not kindle a fire on God's altar until they asked what shall be the pay. God says from the rising of the sun, Unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And yet you have said what a weariness it is to serve the Lord. You have in your flock a male, and you make a vow, and you bring the lame and the sick. This word is for you. O oh, priest, if you will not lay it to heart, if you will not give attention 
and give honor to my name. I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already because you do not lay it to heart. Your attitude is flippant. Your actions are frivolous. Do you know what else the sons of Jacob did? They divorced their wives and married the daughters of wealthy Samaritan families thinking they could marry into the wealth and regain control of the property. They dealt treacherously against their spouses and God said, take heed to your spirit. They said, all that do evil are good in the Lord's sight. Where is the God of judgment? You want to know what else they did? They robbed God in tithes and in offerings. And yet after this litany of sins against God, God says, I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Back in chapter 1 he had said, Jacob have I loved, and beloved God hadn't changed his mind about his love to Jacob. And since God's love to Jacob was unconditional in the first place, nothing that Jacob could do could destroy God's love for him. Well, I say hallelujah. I say glory. I can tell by looking at you, even though you are the elect of God, you too have sinned. Oh, you look pious. But you have sinned against God. Do you want your salvation based upon your performance? Or do you want your salvation based upon the immutable love of God toward you? Now, let me remind you that you do have a will. But your will is feeble. And you do worship, but your worship is frail. And you do works, but so often your works are flawed. But you have not been consumed. Glory, glory. Can I talk to you further about that? You have a will. You possess volition. And you are responsible for every decision that you make and shall give account to God in the judgment. But don't base your salvation upon your ability to make a resolve and carry it through. You know what? Most of you in this room tonight, at one time or another, have gotten under conviction. God has convicted you that you ought to spend more time in the Word. Perhaps you ought to quit dabbling with topical sermons. and start preaching the Bible, you say you believe. Word by word, line upon line, precept on precept. And you get under conviction about that in one of these conferences. And you repent with godly sorrow. And you say, Lord, by your grace and help, I'm resolved to do better in the future than I've done in the past. 
and six weeks later, with your best efforts, you're still getting those nuggets for preachers. What'd you say? I didn't hear you. Your will is feeble. Well, there are some of you in this room tonight who are Baptist preachers, and if someone put a 357 Magnum to your temple and threatened to blow your brains out, if you could not recite three of the major historical epochs of the Old Testament scriptures, you'd just have to go on and meet the Lord. Do you want your salvation based upon your volitional capabilities? You have made more decisions than you can shake a stick at. But your will is feeble. Why don't you will to believe more than you do? If you have the natural capability to exercise faith that you possess, why don't you will to exercise greater faith? I'll tell you why. Your will is feeble. But you had not been consumed because God has not changed. Can I talk to you about your worship? You ought to travel around the country with me. I go to 50 to 60 different churches every year. I've done it for 30 years. I've seen everything there is. I've seen them come right in from the nanny on Saturday evening. Bleary-eyed and sing the family Bible on Sunday morning before I got up to preach. I've been to the churches where they had a 40-piece orchestra. But let me tell you something about your worship. Your worship is frail at best. Have you ever come here to this church, saints, and follow Brother Jerry Jessen's leadership in worship, sing these great hymns, and just thought you were going to be carried on into glory in worship. And yet when you departed these premises, the Spirit of God brought to your attention the words of this old song, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing praises unto him. Oh, for a thousand hands to raise in honor to my king. Don't base your salvation on how well you sing. Don't base your salvation on how often you get into the spirit in worship. Am I saying anything that bears witness with your own spirit tonight? You want your salvation based on that? Let me tell you something about your works. So often your works are flawed. Did you know you can do the right thing in the right way for the wrong reason? Do you remember J. Hugh in the Bible? besides the fact that he drove furiously. God spoke to Jehu and said, I want you to be my instrument in punishing the house of Ahab. And Jehu and Jonadab rode out across the plain of Jezreel. And when the king of Judah and the king of Israel came out to meet them, Jehu put them both to death. He rode into the city of Jezreel. Jezebel had tired her hair and painted 
her face. He said to the eunuchs, throw her down from the upper level of the house that she might die. He gathered the sons of Ahab and executed them. He gathered the prophets and the worshipers of Baal and put them to death. Now God had said, I will give you a blessing. I will allow your sons to reign upon the throne in Israel to the fourth generation. But when we come to the book of Hosea, chapter 1, verse 4, we have this statement. Yet will I avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu. You know why? Jehu did what God told him. But he had his own political agenda. He did not have the glory and the honor of God uppermost as his motive. He enjoyed the slaughter and the bloodshed. And God allowed his sons to reign on the throne to the fourth generation. And then God brought judgment upon the house. You want to know why there are problems in Baptist churches today? Do you? It's because the wills of the saints are feeble. And their worship is frail. And so often their works have been flawed. And even four generations hence, the judgment of God come. But Jacob had not been consumed. Well, I say hallelujah and glory to God. God loved Jacob. But not only has Jacob sinned, Jacob has been stalked. Do you remember Pharaoh and Haman and Herod and Titus Vespasian and Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain and the edict of expulsion? Do you remember Mussolini and Stalin? and Grimler, and Grubels, and Himmler, and Hitler, and Saddam, and Uday, and Hudat. <laughs> Do you remember? I'm telling you, the sons of Jacob have been stalked, but they haven't been consumed. And I am telling you tonight, dear Christian brother or sister, there is an enemy of your soul. The world and the flesh and the devil are relentless in their pursuit of the sons of Jacob. But here you are. Here you are tonight. In spite of the devil's best effort, here you are singing the songs of Zion. Here you are claiming the exceeding great and precious promises. Here you are enjoying the Lord. Glory be. I shall close my sermon now in the words of this grand hymn. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever.
shalt do. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Let's bow and pray. Our Father, we're deeply grateful for the profound affirmation of this text. That our God, the God of the Bible, does not change. Thank you, Lord, that in this changing world of ours, that the rock of our salvation remains the same. Thank you as we face the uncertainty of tomorrow, we hold to your unchanging hand. But thank you more than that, that you hold on to us. We exalt in our God and rejoice in these truths in the name of Jesus.